Good morning, everyone. Well, last week we started a brand new sermon series called the Torah. Uh, The Torah is a Hebrew word for teaching or instruction, and it refers to the first five books of the Old Testament. And we're going to be preaching highlights, not every word, but highlights from each of these five books of the Old Testament. Um, The goal is to read the Torah together. That's the goal. And so in your pews, you should have a little Genesis reading plan, and we're going to be reading one chapter per day. So I'm reading it with my family this last week during dinner. We each took turns, and we read one chapter uh, yesterday, Genesis 6, today, Genesis 7. So you'll see the reading plan. You can take a picture of it or just take it home with you. This whole series is inspired by the Bible Project. It's a nonprofit animation studio making these amazing videos to help us understand the scriptures and to help us read it. So at the beginning of each of the sermons, we're going to play one of the videos. And the reason we're doing this is to help all of us as we then read each, you know, one chapter a day this upcoming week. And it'll give you kind of an overview uh, to help you in your reading. By the way, these videos are all available for free on YouTube. You can look at them anytime. So without further ado, if you look up on the screen, we'll see Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 11. The first book in the Bible is a book you've probably heard of. It's called Genesis. Genesis comes from a Hebrew word. Uh, it's pronounced reshit, uh, and it just means beginning. Now, there's a lot of stories from the book of Genesis, and it's easy just to pull out a specific story and, and try to tell you what it is might mean. But we think the best way to understand this book is to look at the book as a whole and show you how the whole thing is designed. The book is designed to fall into two main parts. You have uh, chapters 1 through 11, which is telling the story of God and the whole world. And then you have the second part, which is about God and Abraham's family as chapters 12 through 50. And how the two of those parts relate, that's where you find the message of the book. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. The first part of Genesis begins with a creation story where God creates everything. And how exactly that happens, of course, that's where all the debates come. But he takes a dark, watery chaos and he turns it into a beautiful garden where humans can can flourish. That sounds nice. It does sound nice. In fact, seven different times God says of all that he's made that it's good. And this is where we meet the first human characters in the Bible, Adam and Eve. They're, they're both individual characters, but they're also representative. Adam is the Hebrew word for humanity, and Eve is the Hebrew word for life. And God creates them in his image. In other words, humanity reflects or is meant to reflect the, the, the creativity, the goodness and character of the creator out into the world that he's made. And they're supposed to reproduce and make cultures and neighborhoods and art and gardens and and everything else. But he gives them a a moral choice about how they're going to go about building this world. And this is what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is all about. And he tells them, don't eat of the fruit of this tree or you will die. What's that all about? So up till now, God has been the one defining and providing what is good. And so God is the one with the knowledge of good and evil. But now this tree represents a choice. Will the humans trust God's definition of good and evil? Or are they going to seize the opportunity and define good and evil for themselves? And Adam and Eve eat the fruit. This is the core biblical explanation for that concept of sin, that desire to call the shots myself, It's the inward turn of the human heart to do what's good for me and my tribe, even if it's at the expense of you and and your tribe. And the problem is humans are horrible at defining good and evil without God. And so now that humanity's made this choice, things get really... Really, they're really bad. So Genesis 3 through 11 is like tracing this downward spiral of all, all humanity. So Adam and Eve, they can't trust each other anymore. And so there's a little story about how they were naked and felt fine about it beforehand, but now they feel shameful because all of a sudden Adam's definition of good and evil might be different than Eve's. And so they hide from each other. Then there's another story of temptation. Cain 
is jealous of his brother Abel, and he gives in and kills him. There's a story right after Cain about a guy named Lamech, and all we know about Lamech is that he accumulates wives like property, and he sings songs about how he's a more violent, vengeful person than Cain ever was, and he's proud of it. Things get so bad with the human race that we see God decide to just wipe us out. Yeah, we typically think of the flood story as about God being angry, but it actually begins with God's sadness and grief about the state of his world. And so out of his passion to preserve the goodness of his world, he washes it clean with the flood. But there's a glimmer of hope. He, he chooses Noah and his whole family, and he saves them on this boat. Yeah, don't forget about the animals. Right, and the animals. So Noah and his family are going to reboot all of humanity. I mean, he must be a pretty great guy. But this is the story most people don't know because it's kind of weird, is that Noah gets off the boat and he plants a vineyard and he gets totally plastered. And then something sketchy happens in his tent with his son. It's a tragic story. So from here, humanity grows again. But things are as bad as before. And the last story is the famous story of the Tower of Babel. And in this story, you have all of the nations uniting together to use this new technology they have, the brick. And they want to make a name for themselves and build this big city with a huge tower that will reach up to the gods. But God knows that this city will be a nightmare. And so in his mercy, he scatters them. And all of these stories, they're underlining the same basic idea. When humans seize autonomy from God, when they define good and evil for themselves, it results in a world of tragedy and death. And this leaves you wondering, is there any hope for humanity? Yes, yeah, there is. It's the very next story that answers that question. It's the beginning of God's mission to rescue and restore his world. Hey there, this and I hope that was a good overview as you continue your reading one chapter a day of Genesis. Well, today we are going to take a look at the story of the fall in the Garden of Eden. The story of the fall in the Garden of Eden, chapters 2 and 3, various parts of that. But before we look at that story, let me remind you of the context. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 tells the story of creation. And it is written in this beautiful, as a beautiful poetic creation liturgy. On all seven days, there are similar refrains that build to a climax in the creation of human beings. So as we said out loud last Sunday, um, one of the phrases is, and God said, let there be each day. And that phrase, and God said, actually occurred three times on the day in the moment when God creates humanity. It builds to that. And then we see this phrase, and it was so, and God created. And then we saw on the, in the creation of humanity, God didn't just create, he created, created, created three times. So then, and each day it says, and God saw that it was good. In fact, again, it builds on the sixth day in the creation of humanity where it says, God sees all his creation and sees all his creation is very good, including humanity. Then God blesses him. Three, a threefold blessing, the central blessing is, guess what? Yes, on that moment of the creation of humanity. And there was morning and there's evening, uh, the days one through seven. And from this, that moment on, the number seven becomes a symbol for completion uh, all throughout the scripture, and it becomes a very important number uh, in, in the last book of the Bible. And the story of creation answers this fundamental question, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be human? And the story in Genesis 1 highlights and emphasizes the creation of humanity. And God has this surprising, wonderful affirmation of humanity in the story of creation. If you remember, surprisingly, we are made in the image of God. Therefore, we as human beings are to represent God on earth as it is in heaven. We are to reflect God's good character and God's good will in creation. God saw that it was good. Therefore, we are to work and take care of this goodness of creation. 
and God blessed them. Therefore, we are to receive this blessing from the maker of heaven and earth and then go out and then be a blessing into his creation. And that context, that context leads us into the, the story of the fall in the Garden of Eden. Now, if, if it just, it goes from good news to bad news. And this is the difficult bad news today. Well, let me describe the type of literature. It changes. So the type of literature changes from Genesis 1 to Genesis 3 and, and 2 and 3. This story of the fall is written as a meta parable. Now, the word parable simply means to throw alongside. So you have a simple story, but that simple story points to a deeper truth. So whether you read Genesis 1 through 6 this week or whether you've read it 20 years ago, we probably have some sense of the story of the fall in the Garden of Eden. So um, it, it's a simple story that points to a deeper reality. So regardless of whether you've read it last week or not, what's, what's in this story? Who are the characters in this story? And you can say out loud, as loud as possible, who are the, sto- the characters? Uh, you've got Adam and you've got Eve. Any other characters? Oh, ser- uh, you got a serpent. That's a tongue. Anyone else? God. I'm going to represent him as he came on Mount Sinai in a, in a cloud, so I'll represent him in a cloud. What else do you have in this garden? Trees. How many? Hello? Two. Okay. Two trees. There's one tree, and it's called the what? The tree of the knowledge, knowledge of good and evil. Not two trees, not a knowledge of evil and not a knowledge of good. Knowledge of good and evil. One tree, and then there's another tree. Tree of life. life. Very good. So you've memorized all of this. The tree of life, life. And of course, there are, other, there are other trees. There are many trees, times, I don't know how many. There are animals, right? I mean, don't ask me what animal that is, by the way. <laughs> um, my My boys wanted me to draw their favorite animal, but I I just couldn't do that. But anyway, simple a simple story, four only four characters, a simple story that we can all remember. It takes place in a garden. There's two trees. We we all collectively, whether we've immersed ourselves and meditated on this story or not, just have a sense of this story. But it's a simple story that points to a much bigger deeper truth. Um, And it's a meta parable because it is a universal story for all of humanity. It's all of humanity's story. So let's take a look at this. The story of the fall in the Garden of Eden. This story answers three fundamental questions. We already looked at what it it means to be a human in Genesis 1, but this story answers three fundamental questions. One, what are we created for? Two, what went wrong? I mean, all you have to do is open the news and anyone could say, look, something is tragically wrong if we look out here. What, what's the answer to that? What is the fundamental issue? What went wrong? And then what are the consequences for what went wrong? So I'm going to walk through this, this amazing uh, uh, scripture, and I'm going to answer, we're going to try to answer those three questions one at a time. Does that sound good? So, the story of the fall in the Garden of Eden. Question number one, what are we created for? We are created for wholeness in relationships. 
In Genesis chapter 1 through 2, we discover we are created for relationships. We are fundamentally relational creatures. And, and God longs for shalom, for the way it's supposed to be, for wholeness in all of our relationships. In Genesis 1, we see that God himself is a relational God. For example, on the sixth day of creation, God said, and usually it says let there, but it says let us, let us make human beings. Now we know from the gospel of John, John chapter 1, that Jesus was with God before the creation of the world. So when Genesis 1 says we're made in the image of God, it means that we too were made for relationships. Now, you may have heard this story of the fall many, many times, but today we're going to look at it through the lens of relationship. Today we're going to look at what happens to our relationships when sin enters the world. And Genesis 2 is going to highlight four fundamental relationships, that we have a relationship with the earth, we have a relationship with God, we have a relationship with with others, and we have a relationship with ourselves. And so we're going to take a look first at those four fundamental relationships as we walk through this text. So first, we are made for a relationship with the earth. Um, Genesis chapter 2. This account begins here in verse 4. It says, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And I want to point something out here. I'm using the NIV translation. The NIV translates this word account. The, the, the Hebrew word is the word genealogy, which is a very important word in the book of Genesis. Um, it's trans, uh, if it's stated 39 times, it's translated genealogy 38 times. So it's an account of the descendants. That's going to be super important, and I'll come back to this later, because God's salvation comes through this genealogy starting in Adam. So we we start here with this genealogies of the heavens and the earth. And now, verse 5, now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had sent rain on the earth, and there was no one, no Adam. Can you say that word? Adam. Adam. No one. To work, uh, to work the ground. Now, the Hebrew word for ground is Adama. Can you say that? Adama, the ground. Adam, humanity, the ground. Adama. But the streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the Adama. Then the Lord God formed an Adam from the dust of the ground of the Adama. <laughs> The Lord took the dust and formed just like a, a potter is shaping clay. And we're, we see in this text itself, we're made for a relationship with the earth. We're earthy. Adam's name, Adam, is an earthy name. It, it's, it's connected with this word for ground, Adama. So the story is a way, it has a way of saying that humanity itself is connected to the earth. We are earthy creatures. We have a relationship with the earth. Secondly, the story tells us we are made for a relationship with the living God. And right after this creation in verse 7, and God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became then a living being. And Paul then works with this in Acts when he says, in God we live and we move and we have our being, that God holds us together. It's this breath of life, his life that breathes life into us. We're made for a relationship with the living God who breathes life into us fundamentally. Thirdly, we are made for a relationship with others. And I love this whole part of the story. And starting in verse 18, we see the naming of the animals. And this is an important verse. Verse 18, the Lord God said, what did he say? It is not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now, if you remember in Genesis 1, in all of creation, all the days, it's good. 
It's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's very good. In all of creation, everything is not only good, but very good. Here's the first time when it's not good. What is not good in the midst of this creation, says the Lord. It's not good for us to be alone. It's not good for us to be alone. That's what God sees. And he's going to make some help. So God makes, starts with the animals. Now the Lord God had formed out of the, the Adama, just like Adam, all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the Adam to see what he would name them. And whatever the man, Adam, called each living creature, that was its name. And so the man, Adam, gives names to all the livestock, the birds, the, and the sky, and all the wild animals, there's countless wild animals. But None of the animals can alleviate his aloneness. But Adam, for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And then I love this. We see the creation of the woman. Verse 21. So God caused man, Adam, to fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took out of the man's rib... And by the way, symbolically, this is his side. That means that that talks about the equality between the genders, not made from the head or from the feet, but comes from the side, the rib, and then closes up the place of this flesh. Then the Lord God made a isha. He say that? Isha. From the rib. He had taken out of the Adam, and he brought isha to the Adam. And then what, is, what does the man do? The only sensible thing to do. He breaks out into poetry. He sings a song. A love song. You ready? He breaks out into poetry. And the man said, This is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Oh, it's bone of my bones. Flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called Isha. For she is taken out of Ish. Again, you see that connection between the earth and humanity, and now you see that connection between the man and the woman, the Ish and the Isha. For this reason, the Ish will leave his father, and he'll be united to the Isha, and they will become one flesh. You see, we have been made for a relationship with others, and it's brought out in this text with this use of the word Ish and Isha all connecting together. And God himself is the one who sees for the first time what is not good. It's not good for us to be alone. We are made for relationship with others. And then the fourth relationship, we're made for relationship with ourselves. Uh, The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Could you imagine? We were created for wholeness within ourselves. To, To experience no shame. Can you imagine... If you were, I were able to stand before any person without any masks, without any pretense whatsoever, full exposure, could you imagine living that way? It's how we are supposed to be and how we were before the tragedy. Genesis 2, we see that we were created for the wholeness in relationships, for shalom in relationships, in those fourfold relationships with the earth, with God, with one another, and with ourselves, without any shame. It's what we were created for. But Genesis 3, in Genesis 3, it all falls apart. Something goes terribly wrong. Sin enters the picture, and it's not the way it's supposed to be. So let's look, continue to look at the story of the fall in the Garden of Eden, and it's gonna, we're going to answer the second question. What went wrong? What went wrong with humanity? And the short answer is sin, but let's take a look at this story. It takes place in the Garden of Eden in verse 8. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put a man he had formed, and God made 
uh, the Lord God made all kinds of trees, right? All kinds growing out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for fruit. And in the middle of the garden were two trees, the tree of life, that's a, a, a eternal life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And a river, Again, we see the river again in Revelation at the end. The river watering the, the garden flowing from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. And you'll see a picture of the uh, Pishon, the Gion, the Tigris, the Euphrates. So this is taking place in that general Middle Eastern area. So then in verse 15, God is going to make this command in the midst of this garden with these two trees. And he's going to make this command. The Lord God's... Uh, took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care and protect and to guard the goodness of his creation. And the Lord God commanded the man, this is before the creation of the woman, by the way, the man, you are free to eat of any tree in the garden. There, were, there was fruit on all the trees. There's fruit on the tree of life. There's fruit everywhere. Beautiful, good, delicious fruit. You can eat from all of them. Wow! But you must not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. And here's where we begin to see God gives us Uh, free will, this freedom to choose whether we're going to obey God's good purpose and plan or whether we're going to choose it for ourselves. And then we see the temptation and the fall of humanity. Verse uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals that the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, and this, by the way, is how temptation works. Did God really say you must not eat of any tree of, in the garden? It's just so subtly off. There's things kind of true about it, but not quite true. It's any tree. Of course we can eat of any tree. That's not exactly what he said. So the woman says correctly to the serpent, well, we, must, uh, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. You, and, then he, and then the serpent says a flat-out lie. Well, you will certainly not die, uh, um, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and that, that is true. Uh, and you will be like God. And again, this is such a subtle manipulation because we're already made in the likeness and the image of God. We're already made in that. Um, so he's, he's claiming something that is already true as if there's something that isn't true. And now he says, knowing good and evil. Well, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. What's the point of this? This story is saying that all of humanity is susceptible to temptation. All humanity is susceptible to not trusting in the goodness of God. All of us, all of us are susceptible to disobedience to his good will. There is something in human nature that falls into temptation and falls into sin. I mean, amen? In Genesis 3, it all falls apart. Sin enters into the picture. It's not the way it's supposed to be. And now we begin to see what happens to our relationships when sin enters into the world. 
And so that, that leads us to our third and final question. What then are the consequences? What happens when sin enters the world? What are the consequences of the fall? And it's, broke, it's fundamentally brokenness in all of our relationships leading to death. Sin breaks relationships, which is what we're made for. Sin, when sin entered the picture, we experience a brokenness with ourselves, do we not? Genesis 3, 7, then their eye, the eyes of both of them were open. Remember, they knew goodness, but now they were, it was open to evil, to wrongdoing. And they realized then, in the midst of that, they then realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves. You see, when sin enters the picture, and this is a macro story, but you pull it into your own life, and it happens this way. When sin enters, then there is, we cover ourselves, subtle or not so subtle ways. We are ashamed at ourselves at the most fundamental levels, and we hide. And it breaks our relationship with ourself. When sin enters the picture, we experience a brokenness with others. Genesis 11, 3.11, and God said, who told you that you were naked? So they, they were full and free and alive and good. Who told you this? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And who is he talking to? The man. He told it to the man, to Adam. And what did the man do? The man said, Yes, Lord, I take full responsibility for my actions. And I am sorry, I admit I was wrong, and I'd like your forgiveness. Is that what happens? I mean, is that what tends to happen in the world today when we sin? Yes, I take full responsibility. Please. What tends to happen? is blame shifting. So what does the man do? The man says, I mean, listen to this. The man says, well, the woman, the woman that you put here. I didn't even ask for the woman. You put the woman here. Whose fault is this? Your fault. The woman you put here with me. She gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. It's her fault. Well, then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And what does she do? Yes, Lord, uh, I accept full responsibility. I picked the fruit and I ate it. No, she does the same thing that the man does. Humanity does the same thing. Well, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. We blame ship. When sin enters the picture, not only are, are we hidden then, but we then, we, when it comes to our relationship with others, we blame. We blame others for, for our own responsibility. We blame shift and we accuse. And what do you think that does in that relationship? It, it, it breaks that relationship. It breaks our relationships. And we see it on the macro level throughout the world even to, to today. When sin enters the picture, we experience a broken relationship with the earth. It doesn't work the way it's supposed to. To Adam, God says, cursed is the ground, the Adama, the very thing you were created from because of you. It's going to be painful toil. Through painful toil, you'll eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. Uh, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat the food until you return to the Adama, since, it, it, since from Adama you are taken. For dust you are, and to dust you return. Notice that relationship with the earth. It's thorns and thistles now. It's pain. It's sweat. It's, the, it's, it's a curse on the earth itself, and it breaks our relationship with the earth. The, and then most tragically, most tragically, when sin, and most fundamentally, and I think this is the heart of, of the, the tragic consequence of sin, is when sin enters the picture, we experience a broken relationship with our living God who breathes life into us. L- listen to how this is said. Then the man and the woman heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden of the cool of the day, and they hid. Wow. For the first time, they hide. 
from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden. And how tragic. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid from you. When sin enters the picture, we run in fear of God and we hide. It creates a hiddenness from God. And then listen to what happens. It gets worse. Verse 21, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. By the way, this, from this moment on, the symbol for garments becomes a symbol for fallen human nature throughout the rest of Scripture. So we talk about soiled garments, talking about that sinful nature. And we read that throughout the rest of Scripture. He made garments, and the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good. He already knew good, and now he knows evil. Uh, Trusting in his own self rather than the obedience to the goodness of God. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and also eat from the tree of life and live forever. See, that's a sign of eternal life. That, that's creation, that eternal life in the presence of God. So Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove them out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Wow, what a tragic story. You see, sin causes brokenness in all our relationships, that's its consequence. But sin fundamentally breaks a relationship with a living God. It, sin literally drives us away from the presence of God, His good presence. And it ultimately takes us out of the, from the tree of life. And it, and it leads us in to death itself. Wow. So we see the story of the fall. It shows us that we're created fundamentally for wholeness in our relationships. But when sin enters into that story, it causes brokenness in all all our relationships, fundamentally leading to death. Wow. Now this is a fundamental story in Scripture. It is the story from which the rest of Scripture it assumes that you have it memorized, that you understand this story, because the rest of the Bible is the story of God's plan to save humanity from sin and its consequence of death. The whole story is a story to save us from this fundamental problem. And what the book of Genesis is saying is that God's salvation will come through this genealogy. That's why this word is so important throughout the book. Genealogy. It begins in Genesis with Adam. And it's through his list of descendants that run through Abraham... And then Isaac and Jacob and on and on, that God's salvation from this fundamental problem of sin and death finds its ultimate fulfillment and answer in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer to the problem of sin and death. And to the degree that we can sense the darkness of the story, we then begin to see the glory of who Jesus is and what he has done. That's what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is one of the soaring chapters in the book of Romans, and he's talking in Romans 5 about death that comes through who? Through Adam, through the sin of Adam, and then life comes through who? Christ. He says it in a much more poetic way, but essentially what Paul says in this incredible chapter is that the result of Adam's sin, which we just read about, is judgment. Cursed is the ground and on and on, and condemnation, and it leads to 
life apart from God, life apart from eternal life, and leads into death. Yet the result of Jesus, if you think that sin is powerful, you want to see something really powerful. The result of Jesus Christ's death is justification. It's being made right despite the trespasses and leads us into life itself. Let's look how Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. We'll end with this. Paul says, the free gift, this free gift of grace, the, the life, the death of Jesus Christ, is not like the result of Adam's sin. We just were in this story. For judgment followed Adam's sin, his trespass, and it brought condemnation and hiddenness and shame. But the free gift following the many trespasses, because we all follow in the footsteps of Adam, right, brought justification, surprise. For if because of Adam's trespass, we, which we, again, this fall story, death reigned through Adam, well, that's not the final word. Much, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And to the extent that we can see this problem with sin is the beginning of our worship and gratitude for Jesus and who he is, and what he has done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, most merciful God, we confess that we sin against you in thought, word, and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart, not loved our neighbor the way Jesus taught us to love. Lord, we confess our sin. We confess the gravity of this problem. We see its consequences and the brokenness all around us personally and throughout the world. Lord, forgive us. And we come to thank you for the work you did in Jesus Christ. We come to thank you for the saving death of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of all of our sins and the gift of of that tree of life, of eternal life itself. We praise you that your grace is more abundant. And Paul says, those who receive this abundant grace uh, receive life. And so we today receive the grace of Jesus Christ into our lives. And we thank you for the life that it brings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.